here uh, with us um, Stefania Maurizi uh, from Il Fatto Quotidiano. Uh, she's an investigative journalist and Niels Melzer, who's the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. And uh, they are here to, uh, tonight to um, yeah, dissect the Julian Assange and WikiLeaks case. And uh, so the stage is yours. Yes, thank yes. you. Absolutely. We are very lucky to have the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Nitz Melzer, tonight. So I will ask many questions, but I expect questions for you, and I hope you will have many questions for us as well. So let's start, Nils, about this case, because I suppose you have hundreds of cases every year. And why you focus on this with many cases of serious uh, uh, torture, um, and all sorts of serious human rights violations. Yeah. Well, thanks, Stefani, for the question, because I think that's what many people ask themselves. You know, how, how are you focusing on a person who's locked up or was locked up at the time in an embassy with a cat and a skateboard? How can it be tortured, right? And to be honest with you, that's what I thought in the beginning, because you're right, I received 10 to 15 requests of individuals either by the victims themselves that have been tortured or uh, are exposed to a risk of torture or their lawyers or their family members or NGOs. They, so I get about 15 cases per day on my desk and I, I can do maybe one. So I really have to choose quite quickly. And I remember I was writing a, a report for the United Nations in December 2018. So that would have been actually three years ago. And, and I had this little message coming up on my screen saying, Julian Assange's lawyers are asking for your protection. And I, I immediately had this emotional re reaction of, oh, no, not this one. Isn't this this hacker and rapist and, you know, a traitor? Um, and I'm not going to, you know, be manipulated by this guy. And so I swiped it off my screen and I continued working my, on my report. And it took me three months until I actually I got contacted again by his lawyers in March 2019, about a month before he was expelled from the embassy, and they sent me some medical reports from an independent uh, doctor, a U.S. doctor, who was specialized in examining torture victims, uh, who had visited Guantanamo and so on. And she had visited him in the embassy, not as an Assange activist uh, at all. And she, and she came to the conclusion in that medical opinion that the convention against torture was being violated, that his living conditions were inhumane. And I thought if, if a person like this comes to that conclusion, I probably better have a look at this case. And they, Sorry if I stop you. Let's name her because she's a very authoritative yeah. doctor. It's Sandra, Sandra Crosby is her name. Yeah. So she's one of the first doctors who, independent doctors who visited Guantanamo and, uh, and uh, really someone who is very highly regarded and, uh, and, and impartial. So I looked at this, but I also received some other evidence. And, you know, Stefania, you have a very important role in, in making that available through your freedom of information litigation, where you received the release of some of the email correspondence between the Swedish prosecution service and the UK prosecution service. Because at the basis of the Assange case in the beginning was were these allegations of rape in Sweden and so on, and those those this co this correspondence really cast some doubt on uh, the legitimacy of this prosecution, which I had never doubted before, and so I started realizing that I had a lot of prejudice against Assange, but I didn't really know what the evidence was, and the more I looked into this case, the more I saw that it doesn't hold up. There is really no evidence for this narrative. And I decided, well, I, I think there's something wrong here. <laughs> I can't rely on the governments. I can't rely on what I found on, the, found on the internet just like this. And so I really have to go and look at this case myself. And I decided to visit Julian Assange uh, in London. I, I, uh, I asked for permission to visit him in the embassy. And as soon as I asked for permission, three days later, they expelled him. I might have sped it up also, I, I, I fear, um, although we know today that this expulsion had been planned for months uh, before, but uh, all of a sudden everything went really, really fast. They expelled him 
And uh, he was arrested by the British and put in a high security prison in Belmarsh in London, where I visited him about uh, three weeks, four weeks later, on the 9th of May 2019, with two specialized doctors. I didn't expect to find torture, to be quite honest with you. Um, I expected to find a man who's, you know, a bit stressed, who is uh, in bad health because he's, you know, been in a room in an embassy for six years and more, and that he needed some medical treatments, I would make some recommendations. And I was sure we're in Britain now. You know, he's in British hands. This is a rule of law country. There's going to be due process. They're not going to extradite him to the US and, 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 and it's fine. But then what I realized is how the authorities reacted to my comments and to my requests is that they, they didn't want to engage in a discussion on this case. They didn't want to listen to my assessment. And both of the doctors that I took with me are very specialized uh, people. One is a psychiatrist. The other is the former president of the World Forensic Society. I mean, there's very established forensic doctor. They've been examining torture victims for 30 years. And both of them, independently from each other, came to the conclusion that Julian Assange showed all the symptoms that are typical for a victim of psychological torture. And psychological torture is not some kind of a light form of torture. It is really extremely grave destabilization of the identity through isolation, constant threat, constant stress, constant uh, also confusion through arbitrariness and, and the defamation, humiliation, all these elements together uh, are deliberately employed to to destroy a person's, uh, you know, stability and identity. And we, we could actually measure neurological damage uh, on Julian Assange already and cognitive uh, impairments that were due to that constant stress and harassment that he was exposed to in the embassy already and has been exposed to since then. So we came to a clear assessment. This person has been tortured. And when I confronted the authorities with this, they basically shut down. They didn't want to engage with me in a discussion. And the same happened with Sweden, because Sweden had contributed to this. And Ecuador and the US, all of these countries basically refused to engage in a dialogue with me on this. And now I, I have to point out, I'm mandated by states. I mean, I'm, I'm the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. I'm not an NGO person. I'm not an activist. I'm not a journalist. And other than belittling that, I think that all of this is very important. But when you talk to states as someone who's been appointed by states to do exactly that, to transmit allegations of torture to them, you would expect them to at least engage in a dialogue. And they, they refused. And when I, see, when I saw that, I was sure now something's wrong here. And I started really investigating this case. I looked uh, deeply into the Swedish case. Uh, I looked into uh, the, you know, the, the, the U.S., uh, a case uh, where we saw that the U.S. is accusing Assange of espionage. And I, I really started digging into this case. And the more I did, the more dirt came out, and not on the side of Assange, but on the side of the governments. And uh, that's really a long answer to your first question. Why did I take on this case? Because I felt, well, if, if we have a case of torture in a rule of law, Western democracy, uh, like Sweden and Britain, and as the United Nations rapporteur, I cannot, if I have evidence for this, and I went there with two specialized doctors to look at this, I mean, it's consolidated. I, you know, by law, they have an obligation now to investigate this and to, you know, to compensate him and prosecute those who are culpable and so on. There is no discussion. But if democracies can afford to simply ignore this, um, well, what does this mean for our society? And that was the first thing. And the second thought was, and by the way, what does this mean for press freedom? You know, what does this mean? And, and, and I've never been a press freedom specialist, but I thought, well, here we have a person who, who is being persecuted for the fact that he has dis disclosed, not even stolen, but he's received and dis disclosed, published, true information that proved serious crimes on the part of government officials, torture, murder, I mean, uh, horrible stuff. Uh, I mean, very serious crimes. If, if, if this becomes a crime, 
to bring the evidence for other crimes. And we see that those criminals are not being prosecuted. But the, the, the witness, basically, who informs the public is being prosecuted and threatened with 175 years in prison. What does this mean for people like you, Stefania, you know, who are investigative journalists? And if people like you no longer can work, what does this mean for all the rest of us in society? What does it mean? Do we have a right to know what the governments are doing with the power that we give to them in a democracy, with the tax money we pay to them? Or be, does it become a crime if we ask the wrong questions? I mean, this is really, that's why this is so important. Assange is in, as important as any other victim of torture. You know, they're all the same. But the case is a precedent case that is of enormous importance for the functionality of, of democracy and the rule of law. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Nitsi, you have a book which is coming out in February and is your investigation on the case. Yeah. I was really impressed by the chapter on collateral murder, your analysis of that uh, brutal attack on civilian sin, and you analyze it from your point of view as an expert on human rights law. I would like to ask you to... Uh, to um, to do a quick analysis for our uh, public to explain where the war crimes are involved, what, what, what are your conclusions and so on. Right. Okay, I'll quickly show the book just so people can see it. Yes. It comes out in February. Uh, and it's true that, you know, in the beginning, I, I, I explain my own role, obviously, the role of, of, of WikiLeaks, but this collateral murder video was a very... Uh, important publication, actually the first big publication of WikiLeaks um, is this video um, where that was recorded by a attack helicopter in Iraq, a U.S. attack helicopter. It's it's a, a standard, you know, uh, a telelens uh, camera, uh, and it shows how how those those helicopters are circling over Baghdad. And, and we see people walking in the streets and, and then you can hear the radio communication and, and, uh, and, and the helicopters basically report that we have, you know, several people with AK-47s, which is a, a form of, of an automatic rifle, a Kalashnikov, and, and they, they ask for permission to fire. And then, but on the, on the image, we cannot see armed people, really. Uh, in the beginning, to, be, to admit the truth, we can see two people in a group of about 20 who might be carrying a weapon. But then also we have to know that at the time in 2007, when this was recorded in Iraq and Baghdad, uh, the US occupying forces had authorized the Iraqi population to own Kalashnikovs and to carry them, you know, to keep them at home, especially to protect themselves from the looting. Because when, after the invasion of the British and the, the US, uh, the rule of law broke down in, in Iraq and, and they needed people to be able to defend themselves. So they were actually allowed to carry that type of weapon. And so, and so they received permission to fire. And then what we can see is that, that a group of about 10 people is just being massacred. They're in civilian clothing. They're, they're walking relaxed on the street. So they're clearly not preparing any any attack or something. We know that there is some, some U.S. soldiers uh, from the radio communication. We can tell that there's some U.S. soldiers on the ground somewhere close to there, um, but nobody is is preparing an attack, you know? And and so we see how these 10 people are being uh, massacred. And then we see those, we hear those nasty comments by soldiers like, you know, good shooting and you see these bloody bastards and these, this type, these types of remarks. But the most troubling thing is that then we have the, 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 the helicopter makes a couple of circles and, and, and they report what they see on the ground, all that the dead bodies and then some of the wounded people who are crawling around. And from the conversations, we understand that the soldiers know that it's prohibited to attack wounded people. And I want to, uh, you know, I've been a, a, a law of armed conflict expert on the use of force for the International Committee of the Red Cross. I've been teaching this at university level for more than 10 years. I've analyzed hundreds of 
of uh, combat operations as an expert. So I can easily see that these soldiers are aware that they cannot lawfully attack those wounded people and that also you, in the law of war, you cannot attack people who rescue the wounded um, as long as they're not fighting themselves. And then we see a minibus coming with civilians trying to rescue this man and that this man we're talking about is a wounded journalist, is a Reuters journalist who was wounded in that attack. And the soldiers, the U.S. soldiers, ask for permission to fire on these people. And they receive permission. And then they, they basically, you know, massacre the wounded person and the rescuers and, and the, with a machine gun. And, uh, and, and there's even in the minibus the two, the two children of the driver, they're, they're gravely wounded. So, I mean, all of, of this, this is a clear war crime. When you deliberately attack a wounded person who's no longer participating in fighting or rescue personnel that's only trying to rescue someone, that is, without any question, a war crime. In the, the first scene, uh, I think we have to be fair that, you know, these helicopters are circling at about one and a half miles distance. The video we see is recorded by a tele teleobjective lens. So uh, the soldiers are not that close. When they look out of the window, they cannot see any details. It's too far away. So they have to rely exclusively on that picture. And we also have to be fair that they can see this picture only once in real time. And they have to decide immediately. They cannot, like us, rewind it a hundred times and watch it again from the armchair. So all of this being said, though, you know, the first attack, I think in the best case, it's a very sloppy mistake. Uh, and I don't, you know, I think it's already, this crosses the line to a war crime, but this would be for a court to decide. But the second attack, where they attack a clearly wounded person, and from the conversations, we, we know that the soldiers know that. <laughs> you know, they say, um, okay, he's wounded, and, uh, and, and, and then they, they're saying, oh, now someone is coming to pick them up and picking up the weapons, can we fire? The law of, of, of war is very clear. This is absolutely prohibited, and what happened there is, is a clear war crime. And the scandal is that everybody knows that. The soldiers knew that. I mean, the Department of Defense in the U.S. knew that. Uh, the U.S. government knew that. Uh, the, the public knows it. I mean, it's obvious when you watch the, the film. Um, but it's, and we have video evidence, but nobody has ever been prosecuted for that. That's the first scandal. The second scandal is... Let me person... stop you. Why no one has prosecuted? Why there was no um, international criminal court investigation? Nothing. Well, uh, because the U.S. is not party to the ICC treaty. Of course, they have not, you know, they have made sure that no one can prosecute them for war crimes. And also, uh, now, legally, any country in the world could, and not even could, but would have to prosecute these people as soon as they're on their territory, because war crimes are so-called universal jurisdiction crimes, which means if I commit a war crime anywhere in the world, uh, no matter what nationality I am, no matter where I am, the country where I am has to arrest me and to prosecute me or to extradite me to a country that will prosecute me. That's what the Geneva Conventions say. That's what the international criminal law says. And not only the ICC treaty, but actually even the Geneva Conventions that the, that the U.S. has have ratified. So, so actually, but, but the reason is clear. It's a political reason because no one dares to prosecute the U.S. soldier uh, if the U.S. doesn't do it. Now, to me, the most troubling thing is that the U.S. doesn't do it because it's in their interest to prosecute, you know, people who violate the law of war uh, because we know that the, uh, you know, the discipline in an army uh, diminishes very quickly when you tolerate people uh, committing war crimes. Uh, and so it's very, very important for... <laughs> I mean, even for just the hygiene of the armed forces, that they prosecute these things. Now, not to say that, you know, for the humanitarian reasons and the human rights of these people who have been murdered and their families that don't receive compensation. And, and then it also means that these types of operations proliferate. You know, if you don't stop it like this, this becomes the normal modus operandi. And that's exactly what many 
veterans of the Iraq war have said that this is not collateral murder is not an exception. This was the standard procedure. This happened every day uh, in that period. And so that's really the, a, a major scandal. But, you know, the second thing I want to say is the even you know, bigger scandal is some people are being prosecuted. And, and that's the whistleblower that actually leaked this information and, and the, the, the journalist who published it. Um, so, so that is really turning the world of justice upside down when murderers are walking free and the witness, you know, who witnessed the murder or brings the with 175 years in prison, that's enormous. That's a bit, that's more than any war criminal in The Hague has ever received. That's what we're looking at. And, and you know, when you're asking, well, you know, what, what is Assange actually being accused of? When you look at the indictment, it's all about receiving this type of information and publishing this type of information. That's what, I mean, you tell me, but that's what an investigative journalist does, no? Absolutely, absolutely. This is what we do on a regular, on a daily basis. Yeah. And so, and so now, if I ask you an honest question, Stefania, if I gave you today a USB stick with collateral murder video number two and, and another 250,000 diplomatic cables, would you publish them? I mean, 10 years ago, you probably would have, because at the time, even the New York Times and the Guardian and the Spiegel and, and Le Monde and everybody, you know, wanted to co-publish this together with Assange. But today, they're not even, you know, they're not even really reporting on what's happening here. And would, you know, if I ask you, do you feel intimidated by what's happening to Assange? Would you feel comfortable publishing these things today? I, I, I do feel really intimidated. Yeah. I think I would approach this with serious, serious concern yeah. of not being protected by anything at the end of the day, because I have seen in the last 13 years, which have been covering and investigating this case, that Julian Assange and the WikiLeaks journalists have tried everything. They have tried to use the laws, they have tried to use, to ask for asylum. They have tried to look for protection by the by the media community. They have tried everything, and with the exception of the UN authorities, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture and the UN uh, Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, they have received no no protection whatsoever. So I would be terrified, honestly. Yes, and, and I think that's I think if this is the type of question we have to ask ourselves. It's not about will Assange be extradited or not. Yes, it's important, but it's already working. You see, the example has already been set for the last 10 years. This man has not been free. He's been on the run from a country that's accusing him for telling the truth about its crimes. That's really what's happening here because nothing else that he's accused of has been proven, and they've, they've tried hard. They've invested millions in trying to create a narrative. But everything else from, you know, rape to hacking to, you know, treason, all these things, there is no, that, that there's no proof whatsoever. So all of this is constructed to push him into a corner, but and also to intimidate people like you. And I think that's, that's what we have to understand. That's the effect of this. Yes, it's on Assange and his health and his person, and that's important for the individual. But the, my point of this being a general, you know, a case of general importance is proven by your reaction. And you, I know, are one of the more courageous investigative journalists, and you've been fighting, you know, those those the the, the secrecy for very long through your FOIA litigation that has been so valuable in producing, you know, evidence. And and we know that you know. A lot of key evidence is still being kept secret by these states. And so that's what we're risking to lose. This access to the truth uh, that is so essential for, for democracy. 
Absolutely, definitely. Um, you know, we uh, we know that is precisely what they want, and uh, that's why we we had to fight hard because uh, it's uh, it's uh, about the society we we want, and if we allow to go out to um, if we allow them to go ahead with this persecution, with this extradition, they will. It would be the end of the press freedom. And the, it would be end of, of, of investigative journalism and the right of the public to know. It's not no. just about us. It's not just about the, the investigative no. journalists. It's about the public, right? To know. I mean, and, and I think it's important. You know, I know to many people this might sound alarmist. You know, oh, this is exaggerated. Oh, come on, this is just Assange, and he's going to be prosecuted, and everything's going to be fine. Um, no, uh, you know, when you look in history, that's exactly how uh, powerful states have behaved and dictators and, you know, before in creating dictatorships, you know, you take someone um, and you, you, you de destroy their reputation, you accuse them of, you know, stupid things and, and uh, or even serious crimes, you know, but, but that cannot be proven and you destroy their reputation and then when, when when the whole public is convinced that you know this is a bad guy, then you set an example with him on you know press freedom. But nobody cares about him because they think it's just him and nobody likes him because of his reputation has been destroyed. But the problem is the precedent case can be applied to anybody afterwards, yeah. and that's exactly what they're trying to do. And uh, I think it's very, very important that we are aware of this. It's not whether you like or dislike Assange. It's whether you like or dislike the rights that he has and that you have and that everybody else has, which is the right of freedom of expression. And that's not just the freedom of expression is not just the right to say anything you want and think anything you want, but also to receive that information. That's the public has a right under the freedom of expression to hear and to read and to see the evidence of government misconduct. And that's what they're trying to suppress. Now, if you say this is a conspiracy theory, look, it's very, it's very obvious. The torture, the murder of civilians, of journalists, of collateral murder and other documents uh, has been proven. It's not something that the government has said is not true. No, they have never. They have never claimed that anything is not true that WikiLeaks has 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 proven. Um, so, actually, by law, those officials have to be prosecuted, and they should spend you know many years in prison. Some of them. So, but they will say, "But I received orders." you know, from up, <laughs> and it goes higher up, and the chain of responsibility doesn't end in the attack helicopter. It ends somewhere in a government building, you know, in a nice little office with, or a big office, rather, with thick carpets. And that's what they're afraid of, because yeah. the commander is responsible for this. So that's why they cut this, and they intimidate everybody, and they criminalize it's basically, they say, we classify the information, and if you publish it, you'll be punished. And we classify it for reasons of sec national security. But that's not true. They're classifying it for their own impunity. That's what they want to protect. Absolutely. And, and it's natural. You know, if you, if you accuse someone of murder in court and you allow him to classify all the evidence against him and to make it a crime to disclose it, he will do it, for sure. <laughs> So let's be realistic, you know, governments are not good or bad, they're just normal human beings. And if they make a mistake, they want to cover it up like everybody else. So that's the natural behavior. That's why we really have to insist on transparency for the powerful, you know, uh, we have to insist on, on oversight, on the separation of power, and that it is, we have to insist that it be treated as a serious crime to circumvent these checks and balances, because it threatens the very core of our society, of our democracy, and of our, our civil liberties. And when you look at the, the legal proceedings that Assange has been exposed to, I'm not going to bore you with a lot of legal technicalities, but I've really investigated every single legal proceeding from the Swedish 
uh, accusations or, uh, you know, allegations of, of sexual misconduct where I was able to read original documents because I do speak Swedish. And, and you know, luckily I had all those, those documents that, that you also got a hand on uh, in, through the FOIA litigation. Uh, and and I, I, can, I, I don't know what happened between Assange and these women, but what I do know is that the, the government in Sweden never cared about that. They clearly, from the beginning, wanted to create a rape narrative and maintain it and to avoid, you know, him getting a chance, a fair day in court to actually deal with this. Um, the, the narrative that he evaded these accusations, that he ha- was hiding in the embassy because of the sexual allegations is, is false. He offered to come to Sweden. He wanted to, to testify in this case, but he was afraid that the Swedish would send him to the U.S. without a, a legal proceeding, as they had done with other people before. And he just wanted guarantees from them. And the Swedish didn't want to give those guarantees, which is really something that I can tell from international experience. That's a warning. If, if the country doesn't want to give you those guarantees, you better not go there. <laughs> so yeah, he was, so he, he was yeah. right not to go. And, and they really abused those legal institutions to keep him in limbo, you know, suspected of rape, but unable to defend himself. And so his reputation suffered because of that. And, and then he continued, obviously, with, with uh, you know, the economic pressures on Ecuador. Once they had a new president, Moreno, uh, the U.S. Uh, put Ecuador under pressure. And we have written evidence of Congress writing to the president of Ecuador saying, look, we would be happy to support you economically and to, you know, uh, to help you bring up, you know, country, uh, the, the country situation, uh, economic situation to, to financially, uh, you know, to support you. But there is one, not several, there's one problem. And that's the situation of Assange. And we need him to be handed over so we can ha- start helping you. So that, that we have a letter of, in, of October 2018 of U.S. Congress to President Moreno. And from then on, it was clear and Moreno was working together with the British and the, and the U.S. To, to expel him from the embassy. So that was, and, and that was done without any rule of law proceeding. You know, he had official asylum and it was just taken from him along with his nationality. He had no right to access a court, to have a lawyer defending him. It was just from one hour to the other, he was expelled. And the UK behaved just the same way. When you think the UK is the quintessential rule of law country, which I can, you know, this was my conviction as a professor in a UK university. And then you see that we have a judge um, who is insulting him publicly uh, in, in a court hearing where Assange had said nothing except I plead not guilty. And then we have another judge who's in charge for the, in the first couple of months for the extradition uh, 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 procedure, and her husband had been exposed by WikiLeaks. I mean, it's a, there's a conflict of interest. It's just, you know, even it's a perception of bias that you cannot afford in, in a democracy. And then we have, you know, him being put in a high security prison, although he's not serving a sentence. For two years, he's been in Belmarsh. He's not serving a sentence. He's just being held there in extradition detention. And normally people should be allowed to work and to be with their family and maybe they have an, an ankle bracelet or, or they, in Assange's case, because he has you know, sought asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy before, maybe they put him in house arrest like they did with Pinochet. But you will never, there's no legal basis to put someone in a high security prison. They do this with him uh, because they want to silence him, because they want to intimidate you uh, journalists, that's the reason. And, y- you know, when you see this may, happening... May, Nils, then... may I stop you and ask you something very, very serious, like the the CIA attempt to kidnap or poison him, which is, I mean, which receives so little consideration if we... No. I mean, I was really upset about realizing how little it was considered in the legal processing in the UK? Absolutely. We've had, we've had indicators before. We've had the, the security company that was working for the Ecuadorian embassy to guard the Ecuadorian embassy, UC Global, was actually behind the back of the Ecuadorian government 
cooperating with the CIA and and you know streaming uh, video feeds from from surveillance cameras from the embassy uh, to 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 the CIA twenty four seven. But not only that, we also had indicators before of former employees of that companies uh, you know testifying in court that that. Uh, you know there were assassination plans uh, for for you know uh, against Assange by the CIA, and this was then confirmed also by this Yahoo uh, you know disclosure in okay. September this year, um, where more than thirty agents or former agents of the CIA uh, allegedly confirmed that that there were plans to kidnap uh, uh, Assange to you know disappear him in a black site or even to assassinate him. Uh, was considered at least, uh, but then found to be too dangerous. Um, but it, the plan was to poison him. <laughs> now, I mean, I'll just take another case, Navalny, right? Yeah. <laughs> that everybody knows, uh, you know, and says that, that uh, allegedly the, the Russian government tried to, to poison him. Well, that's what we're talking about. But, in you know, it's the same thing. It's just that in Navalny's case, and rightly so, you know, everybody is 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 protesting and, and, you know, of the Western governments are very courageously, you know, imposing sanctions and so on. But when the same thing is being planned by the CIA against Assange, nobody speaks out. And that's, that's what I think, you know, this kind of hypocrisy that we have in, in Western governments is just so dis- I mean, disappointing. It's scandalous because it, mm-hmm. it, it threatens the foundations of what our societies are. If someone has committed a crime, yes, arrest him, try him, you know, bring the evidence or acquit him, but that's that's the end of the story. But they don't know what to accuse him of because he hasn't committed any crime, so they invent these stupid stories. Uh, you know, he's not feeding his cat and he's playing football in the embassy and all these stupid headlines that you see. I mean, the BBC, you know, I mean, they're reporting on these types of things, but they're, they're not, you know, considerate enough about their own profession as journalists to report on what's actually happening here, that this is about criminalizing investigative journalists. This should be a, a really at the heart of, of the mission of you know, a BBC or a New York Times to, 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 to be very, very outspoken about this. And I'm convinced that if the mainstream media, the main outlets in the Anglo-Saxon world, let's say the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, and the BBC, if they together deliberately l- launched an you know an effort to condemn this persecution on their front pages and the main news hour you know for one week straight this would be finished because the, gov- the government has nothing in their hands in terms of proof all they can do is is orchestrate a secret trial in alexandria the espionage court where they tape the doors and lock the 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 windows and nobody is allowed to witness what's going on and then they they condemn him for something and sentence him to 175 years in prison and nobody even the defense counsel doesn't have access to the evidence i mean that's that's a show trial that's not a rule of law proceeding. And I think the societies in the West and around the world, but we're talking about Western democracies now, they deserve, you know, governments and, and judiciaries that, that respect those, those principles and respect the law. And it's, it's really uh, very uh, uh, worrying. That's why I put my whole professional uh, weight and personal credibility into this case, because I think this is about our rights it's about you know it's about the rights of our children uh, to know what what their governments are doing with, with the money and the power that, it, that they give to the governments and if 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 we allow it to become a crime to tell the truth we will be living in a tyranny that's not exaggerated absolutely i mean we we re- it is about something we really care about we we realize that is this case crucial and we cannot lose it. We absolutely don't want to lose it. Nils, let me ask you one last question, then we will uh, ask for uh, the public asking question to us. Um, this case is uh, about Julian Assange, of course, and it is all about the WikiLeaks journalists because they have a risk as he is. Uh, for now, he is uh, in prison, but they will be the next. 
let's mention Sarah Harrison, for example, the former WikiLeaks journalist who flew to Hong Kong to help Edward Snowden, or many, many others, Christy Rafson, uh, Joseph Farrell. I had a, a freedom of information um, case in the UK, and it is about these three WikiLeaks journalists, former and current WikiLeaks journalists. And um, Scotland Yard is doing whatever it can to deny me access to these documents using anti-terror laws again uh, for denying me access to these documents. They we have I have been litigating this case about the WikiLeaks journalist and Julian Assange for over six years. So what do you think is going to happen in this case now? What's next? Well, I think the first one I want to finish this case, to set a precedent, you know, with this man that most of the public still somehow despises because they have been deceived and poisoned by this narrative that has been created about him. Um, but once this is done, clearly they will they will continue. This is not the end of it. This is the beginning of a new era where journalists will be prosecuted for telling the truth about government misconduct. Because then the precedent has been set. And, you know, it's very important as we speak and as we observe this case, already countries are adapting their laws to this new future. We see that in Australia, we see that in the UK, where the, the Official Secrets Act is being, you know, uh, tightened, basically. Uh, we, see, we see that, well, the interpretation of the Espionage Act in the US. Sweden has just passed a law on foreign uh, uh, espionage, where it becomes a crime. When Sweden used to be the safe haven of press yes. freedom, which is why Julian Assange was in Sweden in the first place in 2010. He wanted to establish WikiLeaks there because it was the safe haven for press freedom. Sweden has passed a law just two months ago uh, by which from January uh, 2023, it will be a crime in Sweden to disclose classified information that does not even threaten national security, that's only prejudicial to the relations of Sweden with a different country or an international organization. I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, that's the standard is so low. It's basically, uh, you know, the diplomatic cables, something that's just embarrassing uh, before the relations of Sweden with Austria, for example. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just taking by random example. Uh, it's just embarrassing. That's sufficient. It becomes a crime. So, what we have to what we have to realize is this is you know, states are building a system not only in the U.S., the U.K., the Anglo-Saxon world throughout, but also uh, also even now the Allied countries are building a system where it becomes a crime to tell the truth. It's really you know high time for us to to ring the alarm bell and to to stop this, to insist that we have a right to know. Absolutely. What, what do you expect from the legal process in the UK? What do you expect the next? Well, unfortunately, I, I cannot expect justice. I, 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 I was hopeful. I mean, in, I'm pessimistically hopeful, if I can allow to say that, that the High Court would, would refuse extradition. Uh, but I, I sensed that exactly what happened was going to happen. I said it before publicly uh, and and it, it happened exactly as i as i presumed it would i think that uh that the uk judiciary unfortunately is unable to uh ensure respect for the law here and that they will basically uh waive this extradition through um, they will try perhaps to extend this proceeding another year or two uh, because for the us it's not there's not urgent for for assange to be extradited if he dies in prison in the uk all the better for the U.S. so they don't have to deal with it. What they want is to set the precedent that everybody knows, including yourself, Stefania, that this is what's going to happen to you if you ever mess with our secrets, our dirty secrets. And so I don't know exactly what's going to play out and how it's going to play out. But in the big picture, uh, these states have not persecuted Assange for 10 years for tens of millions of dollars. Uh, to let him off the hook anytime soon. So the only chance he has 
And that's but a very real chance. If public opinion changes, and if the main media organizations change their view, as I said before, this is going to be over. This is, it's just like waking up from a nightmare. It's going to be over. But if they don't, we're in for a long nightmare. Thank you, Niels. Let's uh, open the question from the public. <clears throat> Yeah, there are more and more questions uh, coming in, coming up here. And um, let me start by one that's more like the beginning of the whole uh, story too. What exactly did you expect? Uh, or who do you ex uh, exactly expect to respond in first instance when torture in UK is concerned? Uh, like before you send letters, you would expect kind of a, maybe an, a pol police uh, showing up or something like that? Or what would you normally expect? Well, I, if, if I receive allegations of torture, I, I, I transmit them. I mean, the first thing that happens, I look whether they're credible. You know, if they're, if, if they're not credible, obviously I will, I, will, I will try to consolidate. Maybe I will, my, my team will call the person or the organization that submitted the information and try to consolidate it to make sure that it, is, that it is credible. It doesn't have to be proven, but it has to be credible. If that's the case, I will transmit it to the government. And if it's an urgent case, you know, if it's about preventing torture, if it's a historical case that happened 15 years ago and we're just investigating it, it's, it's not very urgent, then we can take time. I mean, you know, reasonable time frame. But if it's very urgent, someone is about to be executed or, 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 or transferred or extradited, then within 24 hours, I can write a letter to transmit it to the foreign minister. Of, and that's your question, who will act for? Well, my, my interlocutor as the UN rapporteur is always the foreign minister of the country, of the UN member state through the diplomatic mission in Geneva. Um, and so uh, they will then have to distribute it to the proper authorities in their country. If it's an allegation about a police station, they will have to you know, uh, transmit it to the police and so on. Um, but and, and depending on the country and, and the precise allegation, it will be a different authorities. It could be a migration center or something like this. But it's, for me, it's, very, it's a diplomatic protocol. I always have to go through the foreign ministry, and they will then have to initiate those investigations in, inside the country. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next question would be, um, will Assange be able to appeal to the European Court of Justice, or how long do you estimate Julian will stay in prison until the highest applicable court would publish a decision? And are there any moves that can still be made by uh, from, from a lawyer's point of uh, perspective? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm clearly I'm not his lawyer, but uh, you know, and, and his legal team would have to speak to the strategy. So I can't not I'm not representing him, obviously. But c clearly, yes, at some point he will be able. At, as soon as the last instance decision uh, uh, has been, you know, validated by the, the last instance of court in, in the UK, then this decision can be appealed to the European Court of Human Rights. Not the European Court of Justice, that's an EU court, but the European Court of, of Human Rights would be that instance. Uh, they can also already now appeal to that court for preliminary protection, uh, for example, to release him from prison into house arrest or something like this. But that's a bit technical. But yes, at the end, there is a opportunity to appeal to the European Court of Human Rights. And the question of how long it will last really depends on so many factors. What's the strategy of the lawyers? What's the strategy of the court? You know, how long does the court take to decide after a hearing? Do they take two weeks or do they take four months? Uh, it's up to them. And so it's, I can't, you know, I can't, but, but it, it could last anywhere from at least one year to, you know, another three years or something like this. I just want to add one important info about this European Court of Human Rights, because according to the documents I was able to get from the my freedom of information litigation, the UK authorities were discussing with the Swedish authorities an attempt to extradite Julian Assange without allowing him to uh, to apply to the European Court of Human Rights and uh, obtaining the protective measure. So it was a, a, an attempt to extradite him before he could get protective measure. Do you think, Niels, that they could play the same game for the extradition it's, to the US? 
Uh, uh, it's conceivable, yes. Uh, the, the problem is that normally a judgment of of the uh, or a appeal to the European Court of Human Rights is not does not suspend the validity of the national decision. So, if the Supreme Court of the UK allows the extradition, for example, and Assange appeals that, then he can still be extradited, unless the European Court of Human Rights uh, uh, um, orders preliminary measures you know that that assist, that suspends that the validity of that of that ruling uh, so but they still have to decide that and obviously between the decision of the supreme court and the issuing of that preliminary protective measure there will be a few days and so in this time uh, you know they can try to to send him out so it's very important that that uh, that his lawyers react in time and perhaps even you know, provisionally uh, ask for measures like this. But again, uh, you know, his legal team would be better placed to to answer those questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you might uh, answer the, the the next question. Um, what is the government's justification for keeping Assange in Belmarsh, and um, what happens to other high f uh, or high risk persons or persons who are, have a flight risk that are uh, on remand in the UK well the government doesn't just do, I mean they just say he's a flight risk okay well yes there is a precedent that he's basically he's look you know he's asked for asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy so now clearly you know in my view even the whole extradition proceeding is illeg illegitimate uh, and illegal you know, for various reasons, because it concerns espionage, which is a political offense, and because, you know, it's protected by press freedom, what he's done, and, and all of these things. But even if, for the, the sake of the argument, if we, if we accept that this is a legitimate extradition proceeding, then uh, then uh, if he's a flight risk, then yes, you can you can secure his presence, but you have to use the least uh, harmful means to do that. So you cannot take measures that are more restrictive than necessary. And so if you put him in house arrest, a guarded house arrest, where he cannot leave because there's a guard in front of the door, uh, that's sufficient. And it's even cheaper than a high-security prison. And they, that's what they've done with, with, with Augusto Pinochet, who was, I remind you, not accused of journalism. He was accused of having, you know, being responsible for murder and torture and disappearance of thousands of people as the dictator of, of or ex-dictator of Chile and, uh, and, and the British. But he was an ally of, of the United Kingdom. So, but he was in the legal, legally, <coughs> except, excuse me, except that he was accused of serious crimes and Julian Assange is not. Uh, he was in the same extradition uh, kind of a situation. And he was allowed to spend one and a half years in a, in a, in a luxurious villa where he was visited by, uh, you know, ex-Prime Minister Thatcher. Um, but, but Julian Assange is being put in a high-security prison. That's, he's not a violent person. Um, he's put in the toughest high-security prison where, you know, violent criminals are being held. Um, and so that's actually, that's absolutely not justifiable. Uh, he could be kept in, anywhere else, you know, where he can be supervised. Uh, and he has a human right to live his family life, to live his profession. Um, there is, he's not serving a sentence. He's not convicted of anything. And, and, uh, and his health is in a dire state. Of, we have examined him two years ago and, and warned that he would, you know, enter a downward spiral very soon. And it, it, it actually happened. You know, he was not even able to, To, uh, to attend his, uh, to observe his own appeals hearing at the end of October, uh, he actually had a stroke during that hearing. And it's absolutely grotesque that the judges in that hearing, you know, decided that his health was stable enough to be extradited to the US uh, based on some flimsy assurances that don't guarantee anything, you know, that, that uh, don't protect him from anything. The next question fits right perfectly to that because it is, are you confident that the US government won't harm Assange as they promised? Uh, to the contrary, I'm confident they will uh, because, because uh, there's no way he's going to get a fair trial. The public narrative against Assange is so overwhelming and the prejudice is so overwhelming against him. 
Um, he's going to be tried in Alexandria, the infamous espionage court, where I, I indicated before, it's a secret trial. Uh, very often the defense does not even have access to the evidence against the suspect. And there is no press allowed. There is no trial observation allowed. Uh, you know, there is the, 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 the jury uh, takes information from the prosecution that the defense doesn't have access to. Um, no one has ever been acquitted in that court. It's a national security court. No one has ever been acquitted. Um, and, and people are being threatened with enormous prison sentences there unless they accept some kind of a, a plea bargain. In his case, it, it would certainly mean that he would have to spend decades in, in prison. Um, so, so uh, uh, and, and for this type of, of suspect, it's always solitary confinement, which means near complete isolation, no contact to the outside world, no contact to other inmates, no talking even to the guards. Uh, you know, very often uh, the U.S. authorities then say, oh, we have to put him on suicide watch, you know, for his own benefit, which means they wake him up every 15 minutes at night. Uh, he cannot sit down, you know, or lie down during the day. I and mean, it's, it's really a form of torture. And I say this as an expert, uh, and I'm not the only one saying this. Uh, it's my predecessors. It's, you know, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch. Everybody agrees these types of conditions are a violation of the Convention Against Torture and Ill Treatment. Yeah, yeah thank you for the answer. Um, I have one last question, and that's um, probably the big one. Um, what can society do or what needs to happen to stop the extradition from happening now? And what would need to happen to undo the effects of the US government's approach in this case, like the intimidation of journalists? Well, I guess, uh, Stefania, you will have something to say about this as well. I mean, from my perspective, the US has to drop this case. They have to, or they have to be pressured by their own media and their own society to drop this case because you know, the US society is really, is, 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 they have the political influence on their political leadership. Uh, and, and it's in their own interest that they stop this from happening because otherwise they will lose, as I said before, the right to to know what the government is doing. In fact, already lost that right, actually. They have to regain it. And, and I think so, so civil society is very important, uh, the, but the media, especially the mainstream media, that they start picking this up is very, very important. Um, uh, to, public opinion has to turn around, and not only in the US, in the UK, in Australia, in Sweden, you know, and anywhere, anywhere. People have to ask their governments, why are, you ex why are you accepting that a country that you're allied with, you know, is persecuting journalists that expose their war crimes? We have to ask the people that are elected to parliament why they're accepting this, why they're keeping silent, you know, because it will cost, it will cost us very dearly. I don't know what you think, uh, Stefania. Yes, absolutely. I agree, Niels. We, we absolutely have to win this case, which means we absolutely have to put pressure, take to the streets, uh, uh, massive press coverage and investigation. It's a scandal that it took an Italian journalist to litigate a freedom of information case in the UK, in the US, Australia, and Sweden, because no one else did it. It's a scandal that he took an Italian journalist to try to discover the pressure from the Crown Prosecution Service on the Swedish authorities and the, the attempt to bypass the European Court of Human Rights. Can you believe that The Guardian was not able to do this? Or can you believe that The New York Times could not expose the CIA attempts to kill him? I mean, <laughs> it took Yahoo. I mean, can you believe Yahoo had more sources inside the CIA than the Washington Post or the New York Times, they are inside this agency. How can you believe that they were not able to expose before Yahoo News? So we as absolutely have to call them out and to make, to have them on board 
they don't want to be on board, we have seen. They don't cover the case properly. They say they want to be factual, when in fact they, they have not looked for the facts. And it took an Italian journalist and a UN special rapporteur to investigate the case, which is uh, unbelievable, you know. So we have to have them on board, and we absolutely have to win this case, having the case dropped. The investigation dropped because because it is a scandal. I mean, in 20 years of journalism, my experience of 20 years as a journalist, 15 in investigative journalism, I have never heard of a media organization put under investigation for 11 years. I never heard this. I, I don't know. I don't believe it. It exists not even in, I mean, just in uh, seriously authoritarian dictatorships. I never heard of a media organization under investigation for 11 years as WikiLeaks, the WikiLeaks journalists have been. So we absolutely have to win the case, this case and we have not to re uh, rely on the legal process. The legal process is completely corrupt. It's completely corrupt. So we, yeah. it's up to us. It's up to us to take to the street and to have press coverage, whatever press coverage we can. We can the independent media, the citizen journalists, the whatever we can to mobilize people, to have people take him to the street and realize yeah. this monstrous injustice. In the preface to my yeah. book, the Ken Loach, the great film director Ken Loach, calls it this monstrous injustice is absolutely right. Yeah. You know? and, and, and if you allow me to just say one sentence here also, to, to, to conclude per, my own statement here, I, it's just, just to say, don't think that this is just the Assange case, that this is, this is the tip of the iceberg. And I wrote a book about this, not because this is the only case, but this is the, the case that makes it most visible what's really going on. It's actually a keyhole through which you can see into a parallel world that already exists where democracy and the rule of law is being systematically undermined. So, uh, you know, don't believe those public narratives. Uh, in this case or in others, you know, ask questions, ask for evidence, and always ask, you know, who has what kind of interests here? And are we still able to uh, to know what the powerful are doing with the power and the money they have, uh, and that's really at the core of it. Uh, so I hope I hope this this was useful. And clearly, I invite people, you know, read uh, read Stefania's book, read my book, read uh, read about the case, and make make up your own mind. Yeah, you know, because it's about your rights and your life. Absolutely. Let me close this conversation with uh, reminding people that we will keep this conversation in the Whistleblow Village in RC3 World at 10 p.m. We will wait for you. We'll appreciate more questions about this uh, important, crucial case. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both very much for uh, being here. And uh, it was a very interesting talk. And uh, uh, maybe we see each other later in the RC3 Village. And uh, yeah, have a good evening.